Hello, my name is Nalani Brown. I'm the philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones, and I'm going to pick up where I left off in Rita Mae Brown and Sneaky Pie Brown's Cat on the Scent, Chapter 31. Sir H. Van Tempest had recovered sufficiently to fight with his wife, who started it. Why are you protecting him? Sarah tossed her shoulder, shoulder length the blonde hair. I'm not protecting him. The man tried to kill you. I insist you press charges. Sarah, my love, he was behind me. Hundreds of men were behind me. Anyone could have fired that shot. Archie had it in for you. The other hundreds did not. Why are you protecting him? I'm not protecting him. Then what are you protecting? She sat across from him as he reclined on the sofa, more tired from this exchange than from his physical trauma. Nothing. Why don't you fix me up a real cuppa? That tepid slop at the hospital was torture. Angry but composing herself, Sarah walked into the kitchen. It was 6.30 and the maid and cook had left for the day. However, she could brew an invigorating cup of tea without help. She measured out those Irish, loose Irish blend, placing it in the ceramic leaf tray on the brown Betty teapot. She shook her head as if to return to the moment and brought two fragile china cups delicately edged in rose gold. These had belonged to H. Fane's mother. She hoped the sight of them would improve his mood. He beamed indulgently when she returned, pushing the tea caddy. Scones, jams, white butter, and small watercress sandwiches swirled around the plate, a pinwheel of edibles. The cook made up scones and tea sandwiches fresh each day. The Van Temptis practiced civilized tradition of high tea at four o'clock. He eagerly accepted the cup filled with the intoxicating brew. He put raw sugar, one teaspoon exactly, into the cup. Ah, he closed his eyes in pleasure as he drank. My dear, you are unsurpassed. Thank you. She sipped her cup of tea. My mother loved this china. It was given to her as a wedding present from her aunt, Davida. Aunt Davida, you know, served as a missionary in China before World War I. I always thought she was a little cracked myself, but her china wasn't. He lifted his eyebrows, waiting for the appreciative titter. Sarah smiled dutifully. H, you're awful. Pleased, he replied. You wouldn't have me any other way. Sarah wanted to say that she'd be happy to have him 40 pounds lighter, with a full head of hair, and perhaps 20 years younger. Some wishes were best left unsaid. Darling, you're right. I knew from the first moment I saw you that I couldn't live without you. He nibbled on a scone. Americans do some things supremely well. Airplanes, for instance. They build good airplanes. However, they can't make a decent scone, and they haven't a clue how to produce thick Devonshire cream. Odd. That's why you brought over a Scottish cook, yes? Indeed, he reached for another scone. They want their country back, you know. I read the papers front to back in the hospital. Just because I was slightly indisposed didn't mean I should alter my regimen. Why England would even want to keep Scotland or Wales is beyond me. In Ireland? Pfft. He made a dismissive motion with his hand. That's why we live here. Yes, except here we have to listen to the bleedings of the underclass, interwoven as it is with color. Absolutely silly. Not to them, Sarah said, a mite too tartly. Reading the speeches of Martin Luther King, my pet? She recovered. No, what I'm saying is there is no perfect place but some are closer than others, and this is very close to heaven. Americans are too rude to develop a proper tea culture. It takes a great civilization to do that. China, Japan, England, do you even know the Germans? Do you know that even the Germans are starting to get it? With ruthless efficiency, I'm sure. She smoothed her dress skirt. He held out his cup for a refill. They aren't that efficient. That's a myth, my dear. I've done business with them for years. I never appreciated how good a businessman you were until you were nearly taken away from me. Oh? He reveled in the compliment. You never discuss business with me. Dull, my darling. With you, I favor the finer things in life. Music, dance, novels. 
I adore it when we read together, and I love it when you read to me. You have such a seductive voice, my sweet. Thank you, but I must confess, H, I rather like business. I read the Wall Street Journal when you're finished with it, and I puzzle my way through, ooh, and I puzzle my way through crossword puzzles sometimes. I wish I had gone further in school. Beauty is its own school. The more I know, the more I admire your acumen. He placed the cup on the tray. Sarah, building airports is not a suitable venue for a woman. But darling, you don't do that anymore. Now you invest in the stock exchange, here and in London, and you have other irons in the fire. It's fascinating. You're fascinating. She stood up and pressed her hands together, standing quite still. If you had died, if that fool had killed you, I would have been totally unprepared to administer your empire. He, guffaw, he goffed. <laughs> That's why I pay lawyers and, but who will watch them? You may trust them, why should I? Really, my dear, they would serve you as faithfully as they have served me. Henry, my experience of life is that each time money changes hands, it sticks to somebody's fingers. That army you pay is loyal to you, but not to me. And there is the small matter of your ex-wife and your two daughters residing in pladial splendor in England. Well, I forgot. Abigail's in Australia now, in outback splendor. My ex and my daughters are provided for. They can't break my will, and they'd be fools to try because the astronomical cost would jeopardize their resources. I pay the best minds on two continents. Rest yours. No, I want to be included. Sarah, you have $20,000 a month in play money. You can do whatever you like. That's not what I'm asking, and I am not impunging your generosity to me. What I want is to understand your business holdings. I flummoxed, vain temptest began to stutter. Still standing with her hands pressed together, Sarah half whispered, because I did not know whether you would live or die, I sat at your desk and I read your papers. I opened the safe and I read the papers in there. You're an amazing man, Henry, and I don't even know the half of it. I only know what you're doing here in Albemarle County. I haven't a single idea of what you may be doing in Zimbabwe or New Zealand or Germany. I do know you avoid the French like the plague. His mouth twitched. I see. You informed a corporation with Tommy, you formed a corporation with Tommy Van Allen, Archie Ingram, and Blair Bainbridge. I learned. TO10 Incorporated. To date, TO10 has purchased over $2 million worth of land. I had no idea Archie Ingram had resources at that level. The others, of course, aren't paupers, although no one is in your league. His eyes narrowed. Archie put you, Archie put up sweet equity. Archie is your conduit to and from Richmond. I'm not in your league either, H, but my brain does function. Arthy is a county commissioner. He could point towards those areas that the state will develop for claim for highways and bypasses. Am I correct? Yes. And now he has cold feet. Yes. If the full extent of his participation is discovered, he will certainly lose his seat and may be, even be raked over the coals, politically and legally, for peddling influence. I believe that's the term for it. Precisely. Is that what, he was, is that what he's been fighting about? Sir H. Bain Tempest sat for a moment. His beautiful wife, that trophy of all trophies, surprised him. He'd been married to the woman for seven years, and he'd no idea that her mind was this good. She shocked him. He was also shocked at his own blindness. He had discounted her. Oh, he loved her. He lusted after her, but he had discounted her. He drew a deep breath. In part, Sarah, that is why, what we have been fighting about. Archie's a coward. He wanted the money and has been handsomely paid and he has been handsomely paid by the three of us in terms of his share and of the corporate profits. He has a 10% share. On top of that, we pay him an annual stipend through a compl complicated trust that I set up. No, one that leaves no trail to him. I'm too tired to go into the details. Some other time, my love. His eyes brightened under his ginger brows. Some other time, yes. But Archie had to have known what he was doing. He did, 
As the county hearings and various other meetings heated up, he realized that if his involvement with TO10 ever saw the light of day, these grillings would be as little minnows to what wail of discontent. To paraphrase Boswell on Johnson. Is he more? Is there more? He shrugged. He's having problems in his marriage. Tooping some damsel, I should think. That's usually what happens. I don't know who the unfortunate might be. RT has little to offer, although I suppose he's handsome to women. There's no accounting for taste. Some country girl might be thrilled to be sleeping with a county commissioner. She burst out laughing, with the silver tinkling, infectious sound filling the room. This made Tempest laugh too. Sarah, still smiling, said, Darling, I want to be part of TO10. Everything comes to you when I die. I want to work with you. I want to learn. I don't want to wait until you die. And I want to know why you men have been buying these properties. I'm tired. He was. You can't avoid this, Henry. I want to learn. I've watched you. You can turn a shilling into a pound and a pound into a fortune. I do know that before you built those airports in Africa, you bought the land on which they were built. Ah, he smiled. You've been doing your homework. Yes. Have you studied a map of this county? I have, which is why I want to know why you have bought the particular lands that you've bought. There seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. Have you spoken to Blair or Archie or Tommy about any of this? Of course not. And I'll never speak to Tommy again. He was found hanging in a refrigerated vault at Good Foods today. What? Bain Tempest's eyes seemed to bug out of his head. Gruesome, isn't it? Why didn't you tell me before? I thought you could hear about it tomorrow. I wanted tonight just for business, but it occurs to me, darling, that Tommy's death is our business. In what way? He was a partner in Teotan. He has been murdered and someone tried to kill you, which is why you must prosecute Archie. You must, he'll strike again. Don't you see? If he kills each of you, he's safe. Not only will he cover his tracks, he'll reap the profits of whatever you've created. You saved him with that trust, that untraceable trust. I don't believe it, Vain Temptus blurted. Archie, Archie Ingram isn't smart enough to do that. Weren't you worried when Tommy disappeared? No, off on a toot, I thought. Slumming, he grimaced. And then I had other things to think about. I haven't given Tommy much thought. Hanging? Did he hang himself? Sheriff Shaw isn't forthcoming with the details, but it's all over town, mostly because the manager of the plant fired the man who found him. He said he was remiss in his duties, and that man, Dabney Shiftit, has been babbling nonstop. I really don't know the details, but Tommy didn't hang himself. Now, will you pick up the phone and call the sheriff? No, but I will pick up the phone and call Ingram. She stepped toward him, stooping down to meet his eyes. Henry, if that man makes one move to harm you, I'll kill him. Secretly excited by her ardor, he replied, that won't be necessary. Archie Ingram has neither the intelligence nor the guts to pull off a scheme such as you imagine. As for Tommy's death, I wouldn't rush to conclusions. His demise and my, well, accident are unrelated. Will you include me in Teotan? Yes, but I must discuss this with Blair Bainbridge. She pressed her hands together, unless someone kills him too. Calm down, Sarah. I must have the approval of the other partners, and that includes Archie. As for Tommy, the corporation is set up so that if one principal dies, his share is parceled out equally among the survivors. You can't ask for the vote of a man who tried to kill you. Her eyes were wild. I can and I must. Now if you would bring me the handy, I will arrange a meeting. She gave him the cell phone. He dialed and got Archie's answering machine. <clears throat> Hello, H. Van Temp is here for Archie Ingram. Call tomorrow after nine. Goodbye. He folded the phone, putting it on the tea trolley. Now I can't very well call Sheriff Shaw, can I? He paused, a dark shift clouding his features. I liked Tommy Van Allen. Did you? Yes. Terrible thing. She settled on the chintz sofa, sque squeezing in next to him. Henry, you must be careful. You must. I don't want to lose you. Promise. He leaned forward and kissed her. Chapter 32. Lilacs surrounded the brick patio behind Archie's house in Ivy Farms. 
Once Open Meadows had surrounded the strong running Ivy Creek before the property was developed in the early 70s. Now, dotted with upper middle class homes and manicured grounds, the area had lost all vestige of its farming heritage. Eileen Ingram, director of the Jefferson Environmental Council, made a decent salary. She poured what extra money she had into their home and garden. Archie was appreciative of her domestic gifts and he appreciated her. Her fine qualities only exasperated his guilt. Sitting on the brown Jordan lawn chair, smelling the profusion of lilacs, he was startled when she appeared at his side. I must have been half asleep. Arch bail was $2,500. Blair Bainbridge lent me the money and I don't even know why he offered to help. Your lawyer's bills would be double that. I don't know what's wrong. You won't talk to me. I don't think you talk to anyone. You're unraveling. Resign as county commissioner before it's too late. Too late for what? Your political career is over. Get out with as much good grace as you can. No. You're mad. No, I'm not. The worst I've done is lose my temper. Smashing Cynthia Cooper in the face was stupid. He crossed his right foot over his left knee, holding his ankle. I have one year left on my term. I won't run again. It would cost the county too much money to run an election in an off year. The mayor would appoint an interim commissioner. Have you been scheming behind my back? No, I've been trying to save what I can for your reputation. She twisted her wedding ring, thin gold around her finger. But I don't think I can save our marriage. That takes two. What's that supposed to mean? I'm not an idiot. I know there's another woman or women. You don't hang around Tommy Van Allen or Blair Bainbridge without partaking of their castoffs. I resent that, he blushed. Because I nailed you or because I insulted you by indicating you're playing with their discards instead of seducing a woman on your own merits. Steel was in her voice. Your vanity's touching under the circumstances. I admit I have feet of clay. I don't like myself much, but he warmed to his subject. I am trying to salt away money for us, a lot of money. I need one more year. Then I'm off the commission. I won't waste my life in these dull meetings with people picking at everything I say or do. I can apply myself to other pursuits, like making you happy again. Better to have money than not, but I am not waiting a year for you to get your act together. You've lied to me. I have not. Omission is a kind of lie. What man is going to come home and announce to his wife that he's having an affair? I said I wasn't proud of myself. He dropped his eyes, then raised them. Did you hire a detective? No. Any detective I could hire around here would know the sheriff. If someone tailed you, you, if someone tailed you, Rickshaw would find out in a heartbeat. He's on the county payroll. You're a commissioner. I swallowed my pride and my curiosity. I'm sorry, Eileen. So am I. I can't resign. I can explain it later, but not now. I have to stay on and I have to keep my lines to Richmond open. You're a political liability now. I'm under a dark cloud, but it's passing. And at the next open meeting at the end of the month, I am unveiling a workfare plan that will employ people and create new housing. It's a good, it's a good plan and won't cost the county much at all. One cent surcharge on luxury purchases inside the county. She wondered if he was a blockhead or purposely opaque. Intriguing, Archie. I want you out of the house. If you can resolve this affair, clean up your garbage, then we can talk. You can't throw me out of my own house. I can and I will. Your clothes are packed. Your computer is in the black and white box along with your discs. Everything's neatly stacked in the rented U-Haul in the garage, which is attached to your Land Rover. If you aren't out of the house by noon, I'm calling the sheriff. I figure it will take you that long to pack whatever else you might want. And what's the sheriff going to do? Archie was belligerent. Throw you out because I'm going to accuse you of wife beating and that will be the end of your career. Totally. He hurried to the garage. She wasn't kidding. There was a loaded U-Haul. He dashed into the kitchen. Eileen was unloading the dishwasher. Where am I going to live? Blair Bainbridge said he'd put you up in his extra bedroom. 
Failing that, there's an apartment for rent on 2nd Street off high. $750 a month. The number is on a post-it on your steering wheel. She closed the dishwasher door. And I informed your mother. Why don't you run the world? I could. Chapter 33. The daily progress spread over the table carried Tommy Van Allen story, the Tommy Van Allen story on the front page. Pewter sat on the paper. The big news was that cocaine was found in his blood. The post office buzzed. People were in shock, but everyone had a theory. No one was quite prepared for the sight of Tommy's widow, Jessica, cruising down Main Street behind the wheel of Tommy's blazing red Porsche. Harry and Mrs. Murphy noticed her first. She could have waited until he was cold in the ground. Realizing what she said, she quickly added, sorry. The group crowding into the post office all talked at once. The Reverend Jones was still upset that Tommy's bomber jacket was discovered on his truck seat. Big Mim declared that no one had manners anymore, so they shouldn't be shocked at the behavior of Mrs. Van Allen, formerly of Crozet and now hailing from Aiken. It was rumored she had polo player lo a polo player lover who had discreetly stayed back in South Carolina. Tally Urquhart sorted her mail. Sarah Vane Temptis suggested the whole world had gone nuts. Susan Tucker warned people about jumping to conclusions. When Blair walked in, Big Mim buttonholed him at once. What do you think? It's macabre, he replied. Not that. What do you think of... She stopped mid-sentence because she had spotted Archie Ingram Gripe driving by, pulling a U-Haul trailer behind his Land Rover. What in the world? Blair swallowed. <clears throat> Damn, pardon me. Mrs. Sandburn, I've got to go. Blair, your mail, Harry called out. Shut the door, not hearing her. He shut the door, not hearing her. Isn't that the most peculiar thing? Miranda Hogg and Dauber walked out the door. Cynthia Cooper pulled up, as did Riley Kent, dapper even in an old tweed jacket. He bowed and opened the door for her as Miranda stepped back. Cooper wished Ridley's courtesies presaged genuine interest, but she knew they did not. Everyone said their hellos. I knew I'd find the gang here, Cynthia muttered, walking over to her mailbox. Tucker sat outside the front door. She figured cats could tell her who, had, who said what to whom. She wanted to watch the cars and pick up tidbits of conversation in the parking lot. Herb, where's the service? Mim asked. Thursday at 10. Mrs. Murphy sat next to Pewter on the divider counter, both cats careful to avoid the burgundy stamp pad. Why haven't you arrested Archie Ingram? Sarah pursued Cynthia. We did yesterday. He's out on bail today. The silence was complete. For murder? Mrs. Murphy asked. All eyes swiveled to the cat, who meowed, then back to Cooper, then left covered with a reddish bruise soon to turn other colors. Her left cheek covered with a reddish bruise soon to turn other colors. Cynthia walked over and petted Murphy and Pewter. I don't mean, I don't mean for hitting you. I mean for shooting my husband. Sarah's pleasant voice turned shrill. Mrs. Vane Tempest, we don't know that, Cynthia said simply. Ridley Kent spoke up, his rich baritone filling the room. We're all worried, how could we not be? He glanced around the group for affirmation. We're all here now, why don't we put our heads together? Mim, usually the group organizer, coolly appraised the a supper, a surper. Good idea. Ridley, appreciating his mistake, deferred to the queen of Croset. With your permission, Mim, you're better at this kind of thing than any of us. She smiled and stepped forward. The circumstances of Tommy's death are still unknown, are they not? Cynthia nodded. We know he was shot in the head, just as the paper tells you. It will take a while to establish the time of death because he was perfectly preserved, you see, but he did have coke in his blood. I don't care about Tommy, he's gone to his reward. I care about Henry. What if the killer comes back for him? Sarah's eyes filled. Is it possible it was an accident? Herb suggested, not believing that it was. Three shots? No. Ridley folded his arms across his chest. So is there a connection between Sir H. Vane Tempest and Van Allen? Something that one of us might have overlooked? 
Harry interjected. On the surface, no, but we're digging, Cynthia replied. These things take time, and I understand your frustration. Please be patient. Wouldn't it make sense to question those people who sold the guns and uniforms? Harry thought out loud. Maybe there's something peculiar. You've tested Archie's Enfield rifle and other people's rifles. She nodded to the assembled. But what about other supplies? Whoever shot H. Vane had to come up with the stuff. He had to have contact with these people. Along with every other reenactor, but yes, we are chasing them down one by one. I had no idea that Civil War reenactments were this precise. Obsessive, Sarah said curtly. Do you know of any connection between Tommy Van Allen and your husband other than social? Herb asked Sarah. No, nope. she lied. Doesn't Mrs. Wu make period uniforms? Harry remembered the seamstress with, small, with a small shop behind the Rio Road shopping center. She does everything, Mim nodded. She can whip up a dress from the 1830s that would fool a museum curator. She made a lot of the uniforms. She's on our list. We haven't gotten there yet. Initially, we concentrated on the firearms people, hoping we could trace the rifles since we have two bullets, one intact and one flattened. The one that lodged against Sir H. Van Tempest's shoulder blade. The third one's missing. Arrest Archie Ingram. Sarah pounded the table, making the cats jump. Miss Van Tempest, you can't imagine the pleasure that would give me, but I can't arrest him without evidence. He was behind my husband. So was I, Ridley said. So were Blair, Herb, and half of Croset. You don't care what happens to Henry. You don't like him, Sarah shouted. Ma'am, I abide by the laws of the land and I can't arrest Archie Ingram, not without compelling evidence. Herb raised his impressive voice. What's important is we've got to communicate with one another. If we see anything un untoward, Call the sheriff or the deputy. Call one another. No, Cynthia replied. Oh, whoopsies. Do you think we're all in danger? Mim neatened her mail stack. She wasn't frightened as much as she was curious. No, Cynthia replied. Lucky you. Sarah, furious, stalked out of the post office. This set everyone off again. Ridley can't hurry after her. Tucker listened intently, then came in by the back animal door. Whew, she's hot. The cats jumped down to join her. Can't blame her. What did you make of Blair running out like that when he saw Archie? Peter asked the dog. He folded himself into the, ca into the car and flew down the road in the direction of home. Makes me wonder. Let's go over there tonight after work, Murphy suggested. Okay, let's, Peter chimed in. One by one, the townspeople left. Cynthia, Tally, and Mim lingered. Miranda made Tally a bracing cup of tea as she was flagging a bit. Not every question had an answer. The old lady sipped her tea, straight. I think they do, but we don't always have to hear it. Mim contradicted her aunt. Speak for yourself. No one wanted to know the answer when Jamie shot Biddy. No one wanted to know the answer when Jamie shot Biddy Minor. Big Mim hated being contradicted, even by Tally, or especially by Tally. Every place has unsolved crimes because people don't want to know. What good would it do now? Everyone's dead. How they arrived at this state is irrelevant, Tally snapped. The cats knew better than to leap on the table with Tally present. They hung out in the canvas mail cart instead, heads peeping over the top. Tucker sat under the table. Moonshine, Harry called over her shoulder as she emptied the wastebasket into a plastic garbage bag. I know that's not the reason, but that's what the ex I know that's not the reason, but that was the excuse given. My brother didn't make any more moonshine than anyone else in Albemarle County in those days, Tally said. Bad blood. Had to be awfully bad if Jamie shot him, Miranda said. Both such handsome men. I've seen their pictures. Never see, never see their like again. Tally stared off in the distance. Didn't Jamie have a gambling problem? Big Mim asked her aunt. Mim, my brother, had many problems. You name it. Gambling, horses, women, wine. Prudence was not his watchword. Wasn't Tommy Van Allen's either. 
Harry finished with her chore, leaned on the sink behind him, behind them. Somewhat similar personalities. You'd have thought it would have been Jamie who got shot, not Biddy. Biddy was a sensible man most ways. Tally allowed Miranda to refill her cup. Guess we'll never know. Harry walked to the divider and folded up the newspaper. The back section fell on the floor. She picked it up without reading it. People do terrible things, they just do, Tally said. We're animals with a gloss of manners. I resent that, Murphy's tail twitched. Harry opened a jar of hot feline, giving each cat a fishy. Hey, she handed Tucker a milk bone. You remind me of your great grandfather, Mary Minor. You have his eyes and you have his curiosity. Did you like my great grandfather? Ah, oh, I adored him. He had a schoolgirl crush. Biddy was the handsomest man. Curly black hair and those snapping black eyes and the biggest smile. He could light a room with that smile. He bet on horses, cards, chickens, everyone did. He and Jamie bred fighting cocks together. Often wondered if that wasn't it, but it wasn't moonshine, I'm sure of that. Where'd they fight chickens, Miranda said. Didn't you have a pit out on the farm? Oh, I barely remember. My mama wouldn't allow me anywhere near. A beautiful pit out by the back barn, she pointed to Harry. Out where you found the airplane. Nothing left of it anymore. It's full of rusted trucks and tractors. All illegal now, she shrugged. After Mim and Tally and Cynthia left, Harry picked up the paper to throw it into the garbage bag. She glanced at the back page. Miranda, did you read this? What? They bent over the story. A big photo of a golden retriever behind the wheel of a Dodge Ram made them giggle. <laughs> Harry read aloud. Maxwell, a golden retriever owned by Stuart Robinson of Springfield, Massachusetts, received a ticket today for driving without a license. Robinson said the dog was in the cab of the trunk when he got out at the gas station, leaving the motor running. He doesn't know how, but Maxwell drove the truck down the street, finally running into a mailbox. Miranda laughed. Art, Bu Art Bushy will kidnap that dog and put him behind the wheel of a Ford. They laughed harder. Peter said, I could drive a truck if I had to. You could not, Tucker said. You don't have the strength to hold the steering wheel. Oh, I do. She could, Mrs. Murphy took Pewter's part. I'll believe it when I see it. After work, the cats crawled into the parked truck and practiced. This is harder than I thought, Pewter confessed. Yeah, and we aren't even moving. Murphy laughed until she rolled over. Come on, let's go to Blair's. Chapter 34. The cats reached the deep separating the, the cats reached the deep creeps, creek separating Harry's land from Blair's before Tucker caught up with them. Running flat out, she skidded to a stop, her hind end whirling around leaving a semicircle in the grass. Cheaters, you were asleep. I was not. I was resting my eyes. Sure. Peter viewed the steep bank with zero enthusiasm, but vaulted over. Archie Ingram's U-Haul was parked next to the divide, Divine Porsche. The animals inspected it thoroughly, then Murphy bounded onto the Porsche, leaving delicate paw prints on the hood and roof. Babe magnet. She leaned over the front roof and stared inside the luscious, at the luscious leather. He hardly needs that, Tucker sniffed the tires. He's been over to Little Mims. That ridiculous Britney Spaniel of hers has marked it. You can't stand him because he's perfectly groomed. Murphy, that's silly. Tucker turned her back on the cat and walked to the house. You can't go in there without us. Peter fell in next to the dog. Don't go in. Murphy commanded as she carefully slid off the car. Why not? We will interrupt them. They won't pay any attention to us. Blair will open the door, feed us something, and then go back to whatever he was doing. Peter pulled open his back porch door. Peter pulled open his back porch door, which was easy since it was warped. The truth comes out. Murphy whapped her paw from the door. Listen to me. Don't you find it odd that Archie Ingram has pulled into Blair's driveway with a U-Haul? You and I should climb up in that tree. We can see everything. The windows are open. You climb in the tree. I'm sitting on the kitchen windowsill. 
computer walked to the window and jumped up on the sill. If there hadn't been a screen in the window, she would have vaulted into the kitchen. What about me? Tucker, I'll open the door for you a crack. Lie down with your nose in the door. You can see and hear everything that way. If they notice you, act glad to see them and go right in. I'm staying in the tree. Peter watched as Blair brewed coffee. His top of the line machine cost more than the industrial bun at Market's store. A pint of cream sat on the counter next to it. Archie was slumped in a chair at the table, his head resting in one hand. <sighs> Come on, Arch, this will start your motor again. Archie sighed, toying with his cup. Yeah. Oh, will you snap out of it? She didn't shoot you. She isn't running around telling tales. He handed him the cream. You're being given a vacation to sort things out. Yeah. He drank some coffee. Good? Yeah. Dazzle me, Arch. Vary your vocabulary. How about yes? The corner of Archie's mouth curved up. Yes. He drank more coffee. If this doesn't enliven you, then we'll have to look for cocaine, Blair joked. People are saying that Tommy Van Allen, that's why Tommy Van Allen was killed. That you and Van Allen bring in cocaine and the hubcaps of your Porsches. People will say anything. Archie shrugged. You use it? I have in the past. I don't now. You get in trouble? No. Blair sat across from him. I saw I get a lot of other people in trouble and I figured I'd quit while I was ahead. Eileen wants me to resign my seat on the county commission. Not a good idea. Blair drained his cup, rose to pour another. H would shoot me. Archie laughed a dry laugh. <laughs> that damn Sarah is screaming all over the county that I shot H. H. Christ, I wouldn't shoot him. Strangle him, maybe, but not shoot him. What went down between you two? One minute you were... Archie slapped the table with his open palm, startling Blair and watching the animals. And the watching animals. I got sick of taking his shit. Who was taking all the risks? Me. Whatever I did wasn't enough. He wanted to know more, and he wanted it yesterday. Damn. How many times can I run up and down the road to Richmond? Our peer of the realm likes to give orders. Blair checked on the time on the old railroad clock on the wall, a duplicate of the one in, his, in the post office. It was 6.30 p.m. If my involvement comes out, I'm down the tubes. <sighs> Don't be so dramatic, Blair admonished him. The law is murky in this area. Someone would have to prove that you abused your office for personal gain. Furthermore, that information you passed on to us concerning road development is public knowledge. The timetable is not public knowledge. Yes, it is. The real timetable, Archie shot back in no mood for Blair's rebuke. So, it would have to be proved. Archie, for Christ's sake, you knew what you were getting into. Information is bought and sold every day in every profession. If you're smart enough to get on the inside track, you win. Blair, leaning against his refrigerator, shoved his hands into his back pockets. We're almost finished with our buying. All that's left is the cartlet property. But even without it, we're in good shape. After that arch, it's all over but the shouting. It's the shouting I'm worried about. Toughen up. You hungry? I've lost my appetite. I haven't, Pewter called out from the window sill. You, you dits. Murphy would have boxed her ears if she could. Pewter had no restraint. The cat's meow startled the two men. Blair laughed. Pewter, you shameless eavesdropper. Tucker pushed the open door, waltzing in. Hi. Wonder if Harry's around? Archie rose, walking outside to check. He came back in. No, but I hear her on the tractor. That thing is a museum piece. Blair put out cream for pewter and gave Tucker stale bread he'd been saving for the birds. Furious, Mrs. Murphy backed down the tree, practically vaulting into the kitchen. Idiots, party, pu party pooper. Peter licked her lips, a drop of cream dribbling from her chin. The aroma of rich cream overcame Murphy's scruples. She hopped up next to Pewter. Full house. Blair scratched the base of Mrs. Murphy's tail. Damn cat. Archie, eyes squinting, glared at Murphy. She had a big time meeting, Blair laughed. Archie held onto his coffee cup with both hands as though it might fly away. Do you think Sarah cheats on H? Blair raised an eyebrow. I wouldn't know. 
Ridley said she was going at it with Tommy. Archie. Cunning did not divulge that Ridley also told him, told him that Sarah slept with Blair. Was Ridley drunk or sober? Sober. I don't know. He did know, of course, because Tommy had told him about the affair, but Blair had given his word not to repeat it. Sex gets all of us in trouble. The phone rang and Blair picked it up. Hello, then covered the mouthpiece. H. Vane. Archie got up and put his ear to the receiver. Murphy joined them. Archie pushed her away, but she was persistent. Blair, I'd like to have a meeting with you and Archie tomorrow at three. Can you make it? Yes. What about Arch? I know he's with you. He drove past the post office and people saw you run out. You know how small the town is. He'll be there. Archie grabbed the phone. I'll be there. Did you shoot me? No, didn't think so. Where's Sarah? I can't believe she'd let you call me after the stuff she's saying. She drove down to the market. The way she drives, that will take two minutes. I figured I'd call you while I could. How will you get away for a meeting? And where do you want to have it? Blair asked. Your place, I can drive. Goody, Murphy told the others. H. Vane will be here tomorrow at three for a meeting. We'll be at work. Tucker was disappointed. Leave that to me. Murphy strained to hear more. If Sarah knows you're going to meet her, if Sarah knows you're going to meet with me, she'll bring out the cannon, Archie said. She'll do what I tell her. I pay the bills, remember? I remember, Archie replied, a splash of acid in his tone. All right, we're stopping at chapter 35 of Rita Mae Brown and Sneaky Pie Brown's Cat on the Scent, and we will pick up next week. Thank you so much. I'm Nalani Brown, the philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones. 